Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's great to gather. We're in a new year, 2019. Wow, wow. Um, let's pray before we go any further. <laughs> Father God, we thank you that we can gather in this room and remember that you're a good, good father and that we are loved. That's the remarkable thing, Father, that you would love us as we are, we are anything but perfect. But Jesus, Jesus is perfect. Guide us in our thinking this morning, Father. In this part of our worship, speak to our minds and our hearts. And uh, we ask this in the name of Jesus, amen. Uh, before I dive into the sermon, there's a, just a few things I wanna mention. I don't know if you know it or not, but small groups are starting up. <laughs> Did you have a card on your chair? You had to have had. Uh, it's time to register, and time to get in the group. You know, we have 45 groups that are meeting uh, this semester, and uh, this is the way we connect uh, with each other as we seek to grow closer to God. And you can go online, deercreekchurch.com forward slash groups, and you can check out the groups. And if you don't find one there that looks like it would interest you, maybe God is calling you to start one. There's information there too about how to do exactly that. So we would, uh, we would love for everybody in this church to be a part of a small group just because of what can happen in small groups. Messes always happen there. And then we get to process messes together. And that's part of what being um, brothers and sisters is the language of the Bible. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's what we do with each other. We process life. Uh, that's one big thing. Uh, take advantage of the opportunity to get in a group if you're not already. The other is we talk for weeks during December about the gift, right? This is feeding uh, starving children as well as launching a new church in the Centennial area. And we had a goal of raising $54,000. We didn't, uh, we didn't raise $54,000. Um, we raised $71,000. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I get the excess. It goes to me. That, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you so much. <laughs> No, we'll be uh, using the additional dollars to uh, just work with those ministry partners. And uh, you know what? It, what we're learning as staff, you, you teach us when the, something like this happens, uh, we're learning to have greater faith and to attempt greater things. But uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are a very, very, very gracious and giving congregation. And you make it fun and um, challenging to be able to serve the Lord. So thank you very much. We're, we're excited about what's coming up and look for the opportunity in February coming up soon to, we're gonna gather together and put some meals together for children who are starving in other parts of the world. Hope you can be a part of that with us too. Uh, well, here's the thing. One of the big stories this past year is the growth of a movement called, you know, start, hashtag me too. You've all heard of this. It started with the exposure of Harvey Weinstein, who's a movie mogul who allegedly made it his routine to sexually abuse young actresses. It's called the casting couch. There's even that label for it. The Me Too movement is about coming out of the closet regarding things like sexual abuse. Powerful men in powerful positions using their power to take sexual advantage of women. And this movement has exposed men in the entertainment industry, uh, men in the news media, men in the academic setting, men in politics, and men in the church. Uh, all kinds of stories have come out of women being sexually assaulted. After the Weinstein story first broke, one person encouraged people who had been sexually assaulted and harassed uh, to respond with those two words on Twitter, hashtag me too. One day, one day after that request was put out there, over 500 thousand people had responded. That's pretty remarkable and sad. Uh, I, I say this because too, I know some listening to this message have been there and those are your words, me too. And I just wanna say there really can be healing from that kind of tragedy in a person's life. There really can be healing around that with God. And certainly there needs to be justice when these kinds of things happen. And you need to hear loudly and clearly 
uh, because I'm not sure you could ever hear it enough if you've experienced something like that. It's not your fault. It's really not your fault. Part of what has been so disorienting about a lot of this is that the alleged assaulters actually publicly advocated things like gender equality and empowerment and respect for women. In other words, an ideology that's completely at odds with their behavior behind the scenes, you know, their secret lives. Not too long ago, a man most of us have heard of, Hugh Hefner, died at the age of 91. And of course, he was the founder of Playboy magazine and that whole empire. And he helped pioneer what was called or has been called the sexual revolution in our culture. And um, today we live in a world where sexually explicit images are everywhere. I mean, everywhere, used in all kinds of things. And those images are never more than just a click away. Hefner was the poster boy for that kind of thing. It's interesting, a guy by the name of Lee Strobel, many of you have heard of him, he's written some books. He was a news journalist, but he then uh, became a Christian too. And, and uh, he actually interviewed Hefner at the Playboy Mansion just a few years back and got to share the gospel with him, the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Lee Strobel says that Hefner listened politely, but then said this, I have a minimal belief in a minimal God because I want minimal interference from God in my life. And I would just ask you, is that what you want? You want a a minimal God with a minimal belief so that he has minimal influence and impact in your life. We'll come back to that later. All of this kind of got me thinking, you know, if you ruled the world, how would you stop something as awful as sexual harassment? What would you do? How would you do it? In our day, generally, in workplaces and academic settings, what is usually taught is what might be called the ethic of consent. This is the one great truth, the one great law when it comes to sexual activity. The goal here is to teach people to recognize when consent for sexual activity is or is not given. And to make sure that people always know they must honor this thing of consent. Now, of course, the question is why? Why do I need to honor this thing of consent? Why is it wrong? Not just wrong, but evil in our culture to violate consent. And and this is just a little aside, frankly, if you are not a Christian, I would challenge you, you can't really give a good answer to that question. Why should I honor this thing of consent? If I wanna power up over you, if I'm able to do that, why can't I? Why shouldn't I? Who are you to tell me what I can do? You see, I don't know that you can give a good answer. But if you are a Jesus follower, the answer, of course, is connected to what we've been learning together already. We've talked about having a kingdom, a personal kingdom, right? And it starts, of course, with your body. Your body is the place where God initially intends your will to reign. So when another person uses your body against your will to satisfy their appetites, they violate your kingdom. And that kind of thing can be emotionally, uh, physically, spiritually, very damaging, very damaging. And that is why the violation of consent is so evil. It's just that simple. It's also why power, power, you know, is the assertion of my will. And I power up on you. I assert my will over your will. And this is why power, the assertion of the will and sex are so closely related and so delicately and frankly, dangerously connected. It raises uh, another important question that's not being asked often in our day, at least publicly. What kind of habits of the will and self-discipline are required in order to be capable of honoring consent? You know, Jesus and the biblical writers generally were quite clear about this. It's possible for a person, even a very bright person, even a very powerful person to become enslaved to their desires, happens all the time to to really, uh, well, for being honest, it happens to all of us, being enslaved to our desires to varying degrees with regards to varying things. 
This, I think, is why people may embrace an ideology like gender equality or, or for that matter, just a traditional sexual ethic, uh, but then in their private behavior completely betray that ideology because they're enslaved to their desires. They claim to believe in one thing, maybe even really do believe it, but desire has them in bondage and they've become a lost soul or worse, a predatory monster. Here's another question. What sort of spiritual formation do you think Harvey Weinstein or Hugh Hefner received? You do understand, of course, everybody does receive a spiritual formation. Everybody. Everybody is having their spirit, their inner life, that's their thoughts and their desires and their intentions formed and shaped all the time, for better or for worse, on purpose or by accident. And we're learning in this series something very important, and that is that the greatest opportunity ever offered to a human being is to have your spiritual formation taken over and guided and led by Jesus. That is the greatest offer ever offered to a human being because when that happens, then I can merge my little kingdom into the great kingdom of Jesus, which is a kingdom of love and mercy and forgiveness and honesty and integrity And my kingdom lacks some of those things too much of the time. Back in November, uh, we talked about what it looks like when my little kingdom is merged into his great kingdom around things like anger or around things like broken relationships where things need to be reconciled. And some of us have been working on some of those things. Today, we're going to look at the topic of sexuality. If you'd have known we were going to talk about this, would you have come this morning? Uh, Jesus has some really interesting, interesting, interesting things to say about sexuality. Whoa, there we go. This is in Matthew chapter 5. We're in the Sermon on the Mount at verse 27. Jesus says this, You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Boy, that's interesting. Uh, A question. Who is a good person when it comes to sexuality? In our day, the common thought, as I said already, might be somebody who honors consent. That's a good person when it comes to sexuality. Uh, That's sexual goodness, just to honor consent. Uh, In Jesus' day, people thought about this a little differently, though. Uh, In the Ten Commandments, the Seventh Commandment, you understand, forbids adultery, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. So people who commit adultery are bad people, sexually speaking, And people who do not commit adultery are good people, sexually speaking. Here in our text, it's very interesting. Jesus challenges that very idea. Did you notice in our text who Jesus is addressing? Do you know which gender? It's men. The idea of a power differential existing between the sexes is not a new idea. Frankly, it's been there since Adam and Eve. We will sometimes talk about the double standard when it comes to sex. That double standard was actually an explicit part of the law in many ancient cultures, in fact, in most. This is from an ancient Roman law. This is speaking to men as well. And I quote, if you should catch your wife in adultery, you may put her to death without a trial. But if you should commit adultery, she must not presume to lay a finger on you, nor does the law allow it. I don't know, does that seem lopsided to anybody? Little lopsided, I think. Seems to favor men. Understand, Jesus challenges and counters that kind of thinking. Jesus doesn't say what a lot of people then and even today sometimes say, which is this. You know what? If a man lusts after a woman, maybe it's the woman's fault. Maybe she's dressed the wrong way. Maybe she did something to provoke it. 
Back to this idea of kingdoms. Remember, kingdoms are systems of personal power. People who have power will abuse other people's kingdom to protect their reputations, to gratify their lust, to increase or to hold on to that power that they have. And we see this all the time in corporate kingdoms, political kingdoms, church kingdoms, family kingdoms. And what Jesus is saying is that is not okay. For Jesus, lust is the responsibility of the one who lusts. You notice that? The idea of looking lustfully at a woman is really important too. It's, it, it has been misunderstood at times. Jesus uses a present participle here. The idea is whoever looks and keeps on looking goes on looking. In other words, Jesus is not saying that sexual attraction itself by itself is a bad thing. After all, sexual attraction is something I think God put in the mix. It's in, God is pro-hormone. Jesus had hormones, right? That's, that's not a bad thing, sexual attraction. Our sexuality is part of who we are, whether we're single, married, young, old. It's a constant source of mystery, wonder, joy, and maybe other stuff too. Where, where it doesn't matter where we are in life. Sex is real and sex is there and sexual attraction is a part of that. I was at the social security office recently. I'd never been in the social security office but I'm that age. I needed to visit the social security office. It was very crowded. All the chairs there were taken. People were standing around the edges of the room. I was one of those people standing around. There was this young woman there sitting in one of the chairs. She was a very attractive young woman and she looked directly at me and just smiled at me. And I thought, I still got it. (laughs) I still got it. And then she even spoke to me and she said, sir, would you like to have my seat? I never had it, (laughs) I never had it. (laughs) My point is just, Jesus really isn't talking about attraction here, right? Noticing someone. He's talking about someone who deliberately indulges sexual desire for personal gratification. It's continued looking with an inappropriate intent. It's the look. You know about the look? A man and a woman, his wife, uh, go into a restaurant and sit down, and the uh, the woman that's actually waiting on, on them is a very, very attractive woman. And the husband starts staring at her. And he's doing this to feed his own desires for sexual gratification. You can see it on his face. You can read it. It's the look. And the waitress knows it. Maybe she feels awkward or maybe she's embarrassed or maybe she's tempted by a certain sense of power, you know, that that gives her almost a control kind of power over this guy. The man's wife notices it, feels demeaned, feels rejected, feels unloved. She gets angry, but if she brings it up to him, he's just going to lie. He's going to add to the sin he's already committing. He's just going to lie about it. And that damages his marriage and that compromises his integrity. Now, he may think he hasn't violated the seventh commandment, right? But according to Jesus, he has stepped out of the kingdom of God. He's not living like a citizen of the kingdom of God. He's violating the waitress's little kingdom and certainly that of his wife's as well. Anybody here have any idea what I'm talking about or only pastors know about these things? <laughs> yeah, apparently just me. Yeah, none of you. Are, yeah, I'm not raising my hand. Yeah. It's the look. It's a public act with a public effect. And Jesus knew all about this. So I think what we need to do here is we need to just pause. You know, because sexuality is an area that involves so much emotion, so much embarrassment, so much shame, so much hiddenness, so much pretending. And yet here in the church, we're supposed to be a a place of radical honesty, aren't we? Where we really tell the truth and own the truth about ourselves, about life, about this world we live in. So I'm going to have us do a mass confession together. This is a confession of sexual fallenness. You had no idea you'd be asked to do this this morning, did you? (laughs) So here's the deal. If you have ever committed a sexual sin of any kind, if you have ever looked at something you should not have been looking at, if you've ever flirted 
with the wrong person, if you've ever given the look, if you've ever inappropriately tried to attract the look, if you've ever withheld yourself sexually to hurt your spouse, if you've ever failed to talk to your own children as they grow to an appropriate age about these kinds of things, if you've ever felt for a single moment like you could use some help from God about some area of your sexuality, if you've ever said the word sex, would you raise your hand? <laughs> Keep it up. Keep it up. Look around. Look around. If you see anybody without their hand up, that is Jesus in disguise. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. The point is this, we have all sinned in this area and we all need help, God's help in this area. You might think about it this way, you know, in any relationship that you enter into, friendship, marriage, what have you, any relationship, we bring to every one of our relationships many different dimensions. Three of them that we bring from our little kingdom. One is just our commitment. That's the exercise of our will. That's the promises we make, spoken or unspoken. You got a good friend, certain promises have been made to them. You have a commitment to them. They have a commitment to you. So we bring commitment to every one of our relationship, different levels of commitment, right? We also bring our emotions. You have feelings and thoughts about this person, this friend, or this one you've married, and you bring those emotions to that relationship. You either have very positive emotions that draw you in their direction. Maybe you have negative emotions that pull you away, but you bring your emotions into that relationship. And then you also bring your body. And uh, based on your commitment, based on your emotions, your body engages with that friend or with that spouse. That's how this works. And in all our relationships, see, we have these three things, a level of commitment, a level of emotional engagement, a level of physical engagement. And these three dimensions are supposed to be in balance with each other. This is what the biblical writers teach. And so therefore, sexual intimacy, you understand, is God's envision, his, his in, uh, invention to unite two souls it's the ultimate form, of course, of physical intimacy. Marriage, of course, is the public declaration of permanent and exclusive commitment. It's commitment all in, right? Just like physical intimacy, is, it's physical interaction all in. Marriage is a promise, it's a covenant. So to be sexually intimate with a person to whom I am not married is to make promises with my body that I withhold or have no intention of keeping with my will. I'm not going to make promises to you. I just want to enjoy you sexually. You know, when I do that, the Bible says that's a guaranteed setup for a world of hurt. Guaranteed. It will damage your soul and the soul of that other person at some point. And that's why sex outside of marriage is a sin. That's why. Not because God is a killjoy. It's because God wants to protect our soul, our heart, our spirit. If you're following Jesus and you're involved in sexual intimacy with a person to whom you're not married, you know, I mean, I've, I've got to say this, you, you need to stop. You need to stop for your sake, for their sake, and quite honestly, for God's sake, if you want to honor him. You see, Jesus is clearly defining goodness in this sexual arena as something way deeper than just avoiding sex with somebody you're not married to. He wants us to experience a certain purity, a certain health, a certain wholeness in this area, the area that comes literally from the inside out. And all of us are gonna need help with this. So the obvious question is, how do we get help? Where does that come from? And frankly, here's where Jesus gets really provocative. This is the stuff that turns people's heads from that passage that we just read. Verse 29, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. Does that strike you as a little bit extreme? 
You know, Jesus isn't hiding this. He's actually emphasizing it because he doesn't say just any old eye. He says your right eye. And in the ancient world, the right side of the body was the more valuable and honorable side, the more important side. So your right eye, that's your best eye. That's the eye you side up with. That's the eye that's true. And then he doesn't say, you know, if it's a problem, just get an eye patch, cover it, or gently remove it. He says, gouge it out and throw it away. Maybe you're tempted to put it in a jar and look at it with your left eye. He said, no way, put it down the garbage disposal. But, but here's the thing, we, we, read these, we read these things that Jesus is saying and we go, well, what, 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 what is he saying? <laughs> Woo, what is he saying? And it's often thought that what Jesus is doing here is using hyperbole. The thinking kind of goes like this, you know, we ought to take obedience to God seriously, really, really, really seriously. Just not, of course, that seriously. That's the way many understand this. So Jesus is exaggerating here. That's one way of understanding Jesus' teaching. Other people have taken, taken Jesus quite literally on this. There was an early church father. Uh, his name was Origen. Died about 250 A.D., he wrestled with this area of sexuality so much, had so much guilt, so much shame around this, he had himself castrated. So he would not be guilty of sexual sin anymore. And let me, let me just be clear, that's not what Jesus is advocating here. It's not what he's recommending. In fact, what I think Jesus is doing is using some very dark humor to show us that goodness, goodness in this area of sexuality is not just sin avoidance. You might think of it like this. If the goal of God for human beings is just to avoid sinful actions, if that's all his goal is, shoot, we can accomplish that with surgery. Cut out your tongue, you'll never speak words of deception or harassment again. Cut off your hands, you'll never use them for promiscuity or for violence of any kind. Gouge out your eyes. You'll never look at pornography. You'll stop judging people by the way they look. You'll never give the look, right? Cut off your legs. Why not? You'll stop walking into the wrong places. Massage parlors, adult bookstores, whatever. Cut off your ears. You'll never listen to any words of seduction or gossip. Cut off your sexual organs. You'll never misuse them. And you do all of this and you can roll your way right into heaven, a sinless mutilated stump. Glory to God. <laughs> Should we do that? You know, a lot of churches offer membership. We offer membership, but maybe we should change that to dismembership. Maybe our, <laughs> maybe our pathway for discipleship should be progressive dismemberment. In some churches, they talk about, you know, sharing the right hand of fellowship here. You'll reach out that, we'll chop it off and throw it away. <laughs> what I think Jesus is doing is I think Jesus is actually making a very important point here. I, he knew what he was saying when he used this kind of language. And his point is, is that God's will for you is not just sin avoidance. You know, in Jesus' day, there was a group of rabbis who decided they would avoid adultery by never, and I mean never looking at a woman. If they don't see a woman, they can't lust after a woman, right? So when a woman would come into their line of sight, they would close their eyes, they would look away, no matter what they were doing or where they were, or what have you, and I'm not making this up. They were literally called the bruised and bleeding rabbis for obvious reasons. They would run into buildings, they would step off of curbs, but here's the deal. You know, your body parts were given to you by God, not primarily not to sin, but primarily to do good with them, to bring blessing with them. The real problem with spiritual growth by selective dismemberment is simply that it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The real problem isn't your eye, it's not your hand, it's way more serious than that. Jesus names it in verse 28. He says, this lust stuff comes out of a person's heart. That's a, a body part you can't remove. Your heart is the innermost unseen core of who you are. That's the secret place of my thoughts and my desires and my perceptions. That's what needs to change. That's what God actually intends to change in us. 
You see, if I live my life for desire, I end up a slave to desire. And that's why the whole minimalist ethic of consent, it's not enough to build a life on. It just simply is not enough. If I desire to have sex with all beautiful women and I somehow manage to get their consent, the truth is I will have a lot of sex, but it's still sex without any deep commitment. And it's still sex without any deep emotional attachment. And it's still sex with no spiritual connection, no promises, what have you. And that's what sex is meant to celebrate. That's the very stuff that sex celebrates. I'll be having lots of sex, but it will be sex without any meaning whatsoever. And sex without meaning only satisfies physically. And frankly, only for a moment. That's not what God intended this beautiful thing of sex to be. So how do I move beyond just satisfying desires? How do I change myself from the inside out so that my kingdom doesn't seek to impose on or rule over your kingdom? Well, here's the good news. Freedom from the bondage of desires like that, freedom like that can be had. It's a process. It's a process of growing. It's a process of changing. And that process begins when we come into the light, out of the secret hidden places with our sexuality. And I want to say this as tenderly as I know how. (laughs) The moment I, I tipped you off that we were going to talk about sex, some of you wanted to get up and leave. Oh, brother, I don't want to hear this. And for some of you, that's probably because you're carrying around a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, maybe a lot of regret in this area. But hear me on this. There is freedom and grace and healing for anybody who will honestly come to God and step into the light with this. I want you to hear from a gentleman, his Dr. Mark uh, Lasser, I think is how he pronounces his name. And this is a uh, guy who's got an MDiv, a guy who's a counseling psychologist and uh, he's a Jesus follower and this whole sexual addiction stuff almost ruined his life. Take a look. I first saw pornography when I was 11. A local drugstore friend showed me how to steal it. So we had this little ritual going. We'd ride our bikes over there and we'd, we'd steal it and then we'd take it back to my garage and we had a stash of it. And that's how the pornography got started, which lasted for another 25 years. And uh, that was really the, the first, you know, acting out that I did. And uh, then it just escalated like any addiction did from there. And I was hoping that marriage would uh, stop me from uh, fantasizing, masturbating, and looking at pornography. And uh, when that didn't happen, then I was really kind of confused as to, you know, what's the problem here? And it wasn't any problem with our sexual life together. It was just that I had had this 10-year history going into our marriage of all this pornography and masturbation and fantasy. So from there, it, you know, as I got out into my active career, uh, it just escalated. There were opportunities. Uh, I started going to massage parlors and that kind of thing. It went from centerfold Playboy magazine in 1961 to, you know, lots of, lots of stuff later on. Well, I had tried to give this up uh, on a number of different occasions, you know, those those spiritual moments that we all have at church camp the first time, standing around a bonfire, you know, the camp director said, you know, repent, and, you know, we gave us a piece of paper, and so write down your number one sin, throw it on the fire. If you're truly repentant, God will remove this. So, you know, several days later when I got home and was back off to the drugstore, I had this kind of theological dilemma, you know, was the camp director wrong? Was God not uh, uh, someone who delivers on his promises? Had I done it wrong? I mean, I'd thrown it on the fire wrong. What I decided was really a, a kind of a form of denial that I would use for the rest of my uh, active addiction, which was, well, everyone else seems to be doing this. And if God really wanted me not to do it, he would take it away. The internet would not be around for another 20 years. So it was mainly just uh, fantasy and masturbation. But I remember thinking, you know, this is a huge uh, let down. This is a huge disappointment. Uh, I should uh, be able to stop uh, Debbie and I are uh, having sex, and you know that should be not a problem. And and so I think it was really at that time that I started feeling a lot more guilt than I had in the in the first ten years of my addiction. Well, it was actually about fifteen years after we were married. Uh, now I'm in a full-time counseling practice. 
I'm serving a local church, I'm teaching at the local Christian college, I'm serving on the school board. So, I mean, I was a workaholic along with other things. I mean, one of the ways that I was medicating was just being busy all the time. I think the number one feeling that I was having in those days was fear. I mean, I was having lots of anxiety. Uh, this was right before I was going to get intervened on. My addiction had escalated. Uh, masturbating a lot, looking at pornography uh, in video form a lot. Uh, and then just involved in these brief uh, encounters uh, in serial ways that, uh, you know, every time I do something like that, I get just petrified and stop it, and I'd make a commitment to myself, I'll never do that again, and uh, all of that. We'd already moved once, you know, and taken the geographic cure so I could get away from Chicago and start a new life in another place, and that wasn't working. So I was disappointed, anxious, shameful, uh, doing all those kinds of things. and but. Uh, but so intellectually defended, I think. I was, a, I was a PhD level therapist at this point. I said, you know, if I want to stop, I probably can. And of course, that was craziness. Uh, one of the women that I had been very briefly involved with, actually, you know, not hardly at all, but she had gone off to uh, treatment herself for prescription drug addiction. And she had told one of the therapists there at the treatment center, who then reported it to one of my colleagues. So at this point, they had pieced together some things based on what they all observed. And uh, uh, one day, I was uh, coming over to the counseling center where I worked, thinking that I was going to see uh, a set of clients. And they had canceled all of my afternoon schedule, and I didn't know why. They said, uh, there's a few people who want to talk to you down over here in this room. And so I walked in there, and, and I saw these, these uh, eight people sitting around in a circle, and they wanted me to sit in a certain chair. And uh, I was trying to crack jokes, like, you know, I'm, I'm a, you know, kind of a comedian when it comes to tension, you know, I'm going to try to make people laugh. And nobody was laughing. I mean, they all had this serious, you know, really negative look on their face. And I sat down, and then one by one they went around the room and told me what they knew and how disappointed they were and what a horrible thing this was and how could I do this and betrayed their trust. And I was just sinking lower and lower and lower. Finally, by the grace of God, they had included a recovering alcoholic who was a physician. Maybe they thought I was going to faint or something, so they brought a doctor in there. And, uh, but at some point at the end, he stood up and said, and he came over to my chair, and he was standing right in front of my chair after all of these people had gone, and he just stretched out his arms like this, and he said, Mark, he said, your sins with sex are no different than mine with alcohol. And uh, at that point, I stood up, and I just you know, kind of more or less fell into his arms, and he gave me a big hug. And, he, he, he said, you know, whispered in my ear, he said, I'm going to find you some help. And uh, he did. He's the one that found out where the treatment center was and made sure I got there. I'm getting a cab, going to the airport. Uh, I even remember telling Deb on one of our first phone calls from the treatment center, I'm not sure this is the right place for me, you know, that kind of thing. But then um, they, you know, as like a lot of treatment centers, they, they had us go to 12-step meetings. And so the very first 12-step meeting I went to, they had a bunch of the guys from that meeting come to the unit and actually walk us to the meeting. And the guy that came that was going to walk with me was just such a peaceful guy, you know, and he was telling me some of his story, which was similar to mine. And, and I said, man, you know, this guy's got a sense of serenity that I'd like to get this. For the first time, I had sobriety. I mean, I, I uh, you know, had 30 days of not acting out in any sexual way. And that was unusual to me. That felt remarkable. And I felt like I was making connections with people like I'd never known before. Uh, I had uh, friendships uh, that I'd never known before. And, uh, you know, just the honesty and the intimacy that you're able to develop with other men is not anything that I'd never known about before. And, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, there was all kind of guys from all different walks of life. And my own roommate was a New York City policeman <laughs> and just became a, a brother, you know, during that time. And we'd talk into the night and those kinds of things you do in treatment. And uh, it was a life-transforming experience. A life-transforming experience. Stepping into the light is what he did. And I tell you, it takes tremendous amount of courage to open up and confess your sins to God really honestly and of course to others, others that you trust. Sexual sin, here's the thing, it thrives in secrecy. Desires grow more and more and more powerful in secrecy. So seeking help from God and others is really essential 
to getting to that place where it's a transforming experience, what he was talking about. Getting connected to others who admit fighting the same battle is vitally important to overcoming bondage in this area of sexuality. Um, And here's the thing, God does want to help us. This guy, Mark uh, Lazar and others like him, they're, they're heroes, but they're not heroes because of something they did so much as something they just admitted. They, they agreed to tell the truth. And I suspect that there are many who are listening even now and you've been hiding and have been experiencing shame around this kind of stuff for perhaps a long, long time. And you need to know that healing is possible. It really is. And you need to know that we all need help in this area on this kind of thing. I've shared this before, but I, I too am someone who needs the help of others as well as God uh, if I'm going to live a life that honors him. I have over the years used several friends, people I've known, people I've trusted uh, uh, for a long, long time, uh, and I've used them to talk to them about my sexuality. Uh, I've told them very honestly about my struggles, where they are, what they look like. I've asked them to hold me accountable. And God used that simple practice of honest confession and and open accountability to help me battle inappropriate desires in this area. For a long time, I tried to struggle with sexuality, you know, just on my own, just God and me, we'll get through this, we'll conquer this, we'll beat this, until, of course, I got to a place where I was humbled enough to say, yeah, I, I need help. I can't do this myself. The truth is, many of us need to humble ourselves enough to tell somebody else, I want you to hold me accountable. Here's what's going on in my life. I want you to know where I'm tempted. I want you to know the truth about me. And here's the thing I want you to know. Again, there is healing. There there is hope. There is help. And this starts with truthfulness with Jesus. And it usually goes down the path of truthfulness with others as well. And if you're caught in the bondage of desire and if you have a history of sexual struggles with tons of guilt and shame as a result, you can try to go it alone. You can swing back and forth and back and forth between giving in, then guilt, then shame, then prayer, then giving in again. I mean, you can keep it a secret, but know this, your ability to worship God, your ability to pray and to grow your relationships, your integrity will all be constantly impeded. You will have a minimal belief in a minimal God who will have only minimal influence and impact on your life. And my question is, is that what you want? I invite you instead to pray and to mean it God, your kingdom come, your will be done in this area of my life too. And I invite you to step into the light, surrender your will. And if you need help on this, find a trusted brother, trusted sister. If you need to, we can help you find a skilled counselor in this area. That can be extremely helpful. I'd encourage you even start a small group for this purpose with someone you trust, one or Two others, we'll help you do that if that's something you want to do. But this is a church, understand, where everybody is welcome, right? And nobody is perfect. We all need Jesus more than we admit. And we all need each other. We all need to tell the truth to be free of the things that want to own us. And the truth is, we have nothing to hide. We'll all, we're we're all just a mess without God. And if you're willing to admit that and arrange your life around following Jesus, well, the result will be that at the end of your life, you will look back and you will have had a journey of devotion to God and healing and growth resulting in a changed heart. That's really the key, a changed heart. That's the community we want to build together. And that's the community we want to be here at Deer Creek. Honoring each other like brothers and like sisters. Amen? And we have the privilege this morning of coming to the table.
You know, what's interesting about this to me, when uh, Jesus instituted this sacrament of the Lord's Supper, he was in the upper room. And you recall that at that dinner, after dinner, who was it who pledged to Jesus that even if everybody else left him, he wouldn't? Who was that? And then what did he do? He abandoned him, didn't he? What did the other disciples do? Did they stay strong and true? No, they all abandoned him too. And yet Jesus in his mercy and grace gave us a sacrament to remind us that that's who we are. Those disciples who abandoned Jesus, that's us who abandoned Jesus. But what we have here displayed on this table is Jesus' faithfulness. The fact that Jesus never did and never will abandon us. How do we know that? Well, we're crying out loud, he hung on a cross to pay for our sins. That's how we know that. He would go to the extreme of dying for us to pay for our unrighteousness. The things that hold us in bondage, he died to break that bondage if we'll trust him and walk with him. So when we come to this meal, boy, we remember. Do we remember? We remember Jesus' body broken for us. We remember the blood of Jesus shed for us. Jesus said, this cup is my blood shed for many for the remission of sins. And we remember the cross. Part of that remembering leads us also to remember he didn't stay there. He came back from the dead. That's how we know what he did on the cross and letting his body be broken for us, letting his blood be shed for us. It had efficacy. It did what it was supposed to do. It broke the bondage of sin and death for us. This morning, we invite you to partake of this meal with us if you're holding on to Jesus, if you have faith in Jesus, if you're following Jesus, this meal is for you. It's to remind you how much he loves you. It's to remind you that he's a good, good father. It's to remind you that you are loved by him and forgiven by him, and he can give you strength to be who you're supposed to be. I'm gonna ask you to pray with me and we'll set these elements apart for their special purpose. And then we'll have the ushers come forward and serve us. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this bread, Jesus' body broken for us. And as we partake of it, we do it in remembrance of him. And we thank you for this cup where Jesus' blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. And we will drink it in faith. Father, forgive us our sins and set us free from the bondage that we so often feel, so often experience. Help us to come to this table, Lord, so to speak, coming into the light, admitting who we are, acknowledging our need, willing to take steps to let you follow us to people, to places that will break bondage in our life. We thank you, God, for this feast, the feast of Jesus. And we pray these things in his name, his precious and wonderful name. Amen. As you're being served uh, these elements, the bread, you know, you can, as you hand the tray to the person next to you, you can say to them, the body of Jesus broken for you just a great reminder. Go ahead and serve him. Bread until we've all received it and then we'll partake together.
hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is more. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Take and eat. Now we'll drink the cup together. We'll be passing out these. Uh, you'll have a little cup. And uh, please hold this so we can also partake together. Indeed, I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spot and melt this heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Had left a crimson stain, he washed it. Sing that again, Jesus paid it. Oh, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Yeah. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white. Sin, my sin had left. I said, had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Let's drink together. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body, your shed blood. 
Thank you for the new covenant, the new promises that you have given us. Promises that offer us life and forgiveness and the possibility of a changed heart. Thank you that in your kingdom, Lord, our little kingdoms flourish. Help us to be a people who consistently step into your kingdom and live in ways that bless others. Thank you for our worship this morning. In all of this, we give thanks and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.